All right, 4.5. Um, I skipped 4.4 because I, I went through it and I, I couldn't quite find anything that we hadn't already covered. Uh, I feel like I may have accidentally skipped ahead with some of the things I was saying and 4.4 uh, just didn't seem to have a whole lot in it. So 4.5 is using multimedia sources. Uh, multimedia usually means incorporating video um, and sure enough at the end of this page they've got uh, a video linked out so here is here are the first two sources one is this big long article from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica uh, and it's a secondary source and then down here you've got the factory act is a primary source and then we've got this video which you won't be able to watch at school so I'm going to uh, click and watch it here so that uh, we have it um, here we go oh it's only three and a half minutes that's nice <laughs> In the late 1700s, most people worked in the fields on land they did not own. Those who owned the land, called aristocrats, lived refined lives in elegant manor houses. Servants raised their children and did their housework. The landowners and the people who worked for them depended upon each other. It was a system that had existed for centuries. In towns across England and the United States, a series of extraordinary innovations would alter the way people lived and worked for the next 150 years. Inventors had found new ways to harness nature's energy. They built new kinds of machines powered by water, steam, and coal. The new machines replaced hand-powered tools. They did the same work, only cheaper and faster. Much of the work was done outside the home, in specially designed buildings, the first factories. Mechanization began in the textile mills of England, where one machine attached to a spinning wheel could do the work of 50 people. Fuel, clothing, and food all became more affordable. With the development of locomotives and steamboats, manufactured goods could now be sold halfway around the world. Families moved from the villages of their ancestors to new industrial towns. And a new class of people emerged, workers who produced goods. Industrialists, the people who owned the factories, employed hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. And they made enormous profits in their industrial centers. But while the Industrial Revolution brought wealth to some and jobs for others, it came with a price tag. Pollution from coal-powered factories turned the cities black. Lack of housing created the first urban slums. And the demand for more and more goods and higher profits brought the exploitation of workers, including children. Some of the worst conditions were seen in the textile mills of New England. In the 1830s, a 10-year-old mill girl described her life. We were paid two dollars a week, and the working hours of all the girls extended from five o'clock in the morning till seven in the evening, with one half hour for breakfast and for dinner. It was the hiring of children, some as young as five years old, throughout the 1800s and early 1900s, that outraged the public. Workers and reformers protested. They formed unions and associations, and fought for government regulations to limit the workday and protect children. These laws helped address many of the abuses brought on by the Industrial Revolution. Today, we are in the middle of another revolution, a technological revolution. We live in what's called the global village, because we can connect with people around the world as if they lived next door. And we can now work anytime and anywhere. We will have to wait and see where this new revolution leads. Okay, turns out that was a really old video. Um, 
turning points in history of the Industrial Revolution. I think it'll tell us how to cite it later on. Uh, but for now, there you go. Now we've got that video, and I can give it to you on the thumb drive. Um, these you'll read. I'm not going to read that whole thing like I have been reading, because that's a lot, and I feel like I'll just put you to sleep. Okay. So now we look at analyzing source number three. Rewatch it. No, thank you. Uh, what is the speaker's goal? To inform, persuade, or entertain? Inform. What is the primary message to be delivered? That the Industrial Revolution uh, was a drastic change in the, in the way we lived our lives. Why is this person delivering this speech? Is he the right person? This speech? It's not a speech. Why would you call it a speech? I have no idea if he's the right person. I mean, he's a good presenter. A little boring, but, you know, got his point across. Uh, was the objective achieved? Well, if you learned anything from it, then yeah, the objective was achieved. Explanation of essay steps. Yeah, right, so this... Number four here, research, collaboration, and presentation, used to be an essay. And for some of you, it might still be an essay. Uh, it's unclear to me um, how. The, new, the newer you are to the class, the more likely it is to be a test. The older you are in the class, the more likely it is to be an essay. So definitely read these because they're going to, even if it's a test, they're going to ask you questions about these sources. And then let's see here. An overall claim. Form an overall claim. Uh, claim about the revolution, uh, industrial revolution. I like to think of it as saying either. You're claiming either the Industrial Revolution was a good thing, or the Industrial Revolution was a bad thing. One way or the other. Uh, it's just the article again. It's all the same stuff again. Okay. Exercise development. About developing a claim about European industrialization. Appropriate for the assignment. Okay, that's just... Guided practice, analyzing evidence, exercise, collecting research, creating an outline. Let's look at create an outline. Okay, they've put it in the argumentative format so that there's three body paragraphs of a, of a claim and then a counterclaim. So if you say industrialization was bad, you would have to say three reasons why it was bad, and then one reason why it was good. You'd say, yes, I understand that, blah, blah, blah. But if you take into account everything I've said, it's not good enough. That doesn't outweigh the other stuff. Um, somewhere in here, citing appropriate sources. I believe this is it. Here it is. Okay. We used this one, Richard Maine. We used the 1833 Factory Act. Huh. But anyway, this is what a works cited page should look like. You have the words works cited at the top, and then last name, comma, first name. And then the title of the work, and then uh, who published it, and what year. I was hoping they'd give us stuff for the video, but I don't know where the video is, if it was either one of those two things. Okay. Writing an essay, developing a research essay. Revision assistant, of course, we can't use on campus. And let's look at the flashcards. Claims are questions, unanswered questions that may or may not be true and require evidence to support. Evidence is what supports the claim. Reasoning is how you move from the claim to, no, from the evidence to the claim. Um, it's the connection between the two. Rubric 
rubric is a fun one. That is uh, a scoring guide used to evaluate an assignment. Um, that's the big, if you've ever seen one, it's like boxes. They go on the left side, it'll say uh, something like grammar and punctuation, and on the right, how many points is that worth? And then underneath that, a solid claim, how many points is that worth? And it's a, a way to break down all the things about your essay so as to grade it more objectively instead of just the teacher going, I liked it or I didn't like it, you, you know, breaks it down more objectively. Okay, that'll be it for 4.5.